The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, okay, settle down. It's time to start learning. Um, one announcement, tomorrow we'll have the uh, weekly quiz in lieu of the Tuesday uh, celebration. We're going to move to Thursday since the uh, holiday moved everything, compressed the week. So um, last day we were talking about doping of semiconductors and I want to finish up that unit. Um, just to refresh your memories, we, we looked at how we could change the behavior of the semiconductor by introducing impurity atoms. And when the behavior of the semiconductor is dominated by the impurity atoms, we uh, term that behavior extrinsic. In other words, it's not the behavior of silicon itself, but it's the behavior of silicon as determined by the presence of some uh, dopant atom. And we looked at the special case of doping with a supervalent impurity. And here's the energy level diagram for that situation where we've got the valence band down here, we've got the conduction band up here separated by an energy gap, and that's all characteristic of, of plain vanilla silicon. But then when we dope with the supervalent impurity, there is an extra electron, and that is put into a donor level that lies just a tiny bit below the bottom of the conduction band. And then thanks to thermal excitation, which gives us an average energy of about uh, 40th of an electron volt, we get, for all intents and purposes, 100% excitation of the electrons that sit in the donor level, excitation up into the conduction band. And this is what the electrical engineers term ionization. And I also reminded you last day that this is the donor level. And for each donor atom, there sits a donor level at the same value of energy, but these are so far apart owing to the dilution, the dilute concentration of the uh, impurity that we don't violate the Pauli exclusion principle. So these are all sitting at the same level, and that's why the given temperature promotes all of them up into the conduction band where they are mobile. And then, uh, just to complete the review, we call this n-type because thanks to doping, we generate electrons in the conduction band, and electrons are negative. Uh, supervalent doping gives us n-type. Then the total number of electrons in the conduction band is the sum of those that would have been generated by plain old thermal excitation. Thermal excitation operates all the time. So with thermal excitation, recall we promote from the valence band up into the conduction band. So we break one of these bonds, shoot an electron up here, and leave a hole behind. So this generates the pair, hole in the valence band and electron in the conduction band. That's always operative, but owing to the energies involved, the band gap is on the order of one electron volt, whereas the donor level sits only about 1 50th of an electron volt below the conduction band. So we get very, very little promotion at room temperature. And in fact, it's something like 10 to the minus 19 is the fraction of promotion. And if you say roughly 10 to the 23rd per cubic centimeter, that means you've got about 10 to the fourth electrons per cubic centimeter due to this thermal excitation from the valence band to the conduction band. Normally, when you dope a semiconductor, you dope it around parts per million level. And parts per million, that's 10 to the minus 6. If you take 10 to the minus 6 times 10 to the 23, you get about 10 to the 17. And you can see 10 to the 17 is vastly larger than 10 to the 4th. So for all intents and purposes, once you've doped something, this contribution is essentially zero. And so the electron population of the conduction band is that dictated by the impurity atoms, which is why we say that this is exhibiting extrinsic behavior. The intrinsic properties are, are not visible. They're not palpable, immeasurable. So intrinsic is substantially less than extrinsic. And the last thing I wanted to do for you before we 
we say goodbye to this fascinating topic, which lays the groundwork for everything that we know in the modern electronic era, parenthetically, um, is to look at the other type of doping. I've shown you how to make an n-type semiconductor. How do we make a p-type semiconductor? So in that case, what we can do is dope with a subvalent impurity. Dope with subvalent impurity. What do I mean by subvalent? Well, the valency of silicon is 4. So I want something less than 4. So a good example is boron into silicon. Boron into silicon. All right? So boron is group 13 or 3. All right? If you look on your periodic table and silicon is group 14 according to the UPAC notation. So let's go back and, and take a look at how that might appear. So I'm going to I'm going to draw the silicon crystal. Remember, this is going into a single crystal of silicon. So silicon is sp3 hybridized, and we have silicons everywhere in the structure. So we're going to put silicons, and I'm trying to show sp3 hybridization. So this is three legs, each in, in, in the plane, and you've got 109 degrees here. So the silicon and so on. I get three of them just to complete enough of the picture. And then what we're going to do is introduce boron. And boron goes into the silicon lattice and covalently bonds. It doesn't go sit in some void space in between the silicons. It actually sits on a silicon site and substitutes for the silicon. Now, boron is group 13. It's got three valence electrons. And so it forms bonds with three silicons. And now, there's a fourth silicon here. And that silicon has an electron, but the boron doesn't have a fourth electron. Here's where it gets interesting. The, the driving force to complete the picture here is so great that the system will actually pull an electron out of a silicon-silicon bond. Pull an electron out of a silicon-silicon bond. And so I'm going to use a different color chalk. And I'm going to indicate, just for argument's sake, that we're going to pull an electron out of this bond here, break this bond, and shoot that electron over to here. That way we get four bonds around the boron. It's sp3 hybridized. It just doesn't have that extra electron. But now it rips the electron out of this silicon-silicon bond. And what's the consequence of breaking this bond? What's the electrical feature that we've created here? A hole. So now we've created a hole somewhere else in the crystal in order to satisfy the desire of boron to get that fourth bond. And now can you see that for every boron that I introduce into the crystal, I'm going to make a hole somewhere in the crystal. And on the energy level diagram, where do those holes live? Those holes live in the valence band. So let's go make the energy level diagram. So up here we have the conduction band. And downstairs we have the valence band as before. And I'm going to assume that we got the thermal promotion, but it's so tiny in comparison to the amount of boron that go we're going to put in. I'm not going to muddy the water here and show that you've got pair uh, formation, because the extent of it is so small, it doesn't make any difference. So now what happens? Now, I know I'm going to generate holes here, and I've got to show this energy level. And this bonding level is different from this bonding level, agreed? Silicon-silicon bond has different bond energy from boron-silicon bond. So that means the top of the valence band is different from, because this valence band is silicon, silicon, silicon. So it turns out that, and this is not to scale, that the energy level of this bond is just a little bit higher. And this is an energy level that involves the accepting of electrons, whereas in the other case, we were donating electrons. Hence, that's called the donor level. This is called the acceptor level. This is called the acceptor level. And it's about a 50th of an electron volt above the top of the valence band. And so what happens is that in order to make this bond, we move something out of the valence band up into the acceptor level and generate a hole. And so for every boron that we put in, we have another broken bond. And all of these lie at the same level, but the dilution is so high that they're so far apart that they don't violate the Pauli exclusion principle, and they're thermally promoted up, and away we go. So now, 
under these circumstances, the number of negative charge carriers no longer equals the number of positive charge carriers. Because I've got all these positive charge carriers thanks to the introduction of boron, P is greater than N. So we've made a P-type semiconductor, P-type semiconductor by the introduction of a subvalent impurity. And we can redo the entire central part of last day's lesson, which was the Bohr model. Now this is the sexiest part of the Bohr model I've ever seen. This is really, really cool. The hole is mobile. The hole is mobile. And the boron, the boron is a little bit shy of protons, right? The boron's shy of protons. It's, it's three in a land of four. So it's negative. So I've got a stationary negative center, a stationary negative center, and I've got something positive revolving around a negative center. This is an inverse Bohr model. Because the Bohr model has a honking big positive center with the dinky little electron revolving around. We've got the immobile negative center and the mobile hole revolving around. Go through, you get the same set of quantum. I mean, there's a whole bunch of quantum levels in here. and everything. It's fantastic how far that Bohr model can take us. So now, you know how to make a P-type semiconductor, you know how to make an N-type semiconductor. And then what you can do, what you can do is then put them together. And you can put, say, boron-doped, boron-doped silicon opposite phosphorus-doped silicon. Be careful here. Uh, the, the fonts are really critical. This is uppercase P for phosphorus. This is lowercase p for positive doping. So don't go, oh, P, phosphorus, that means it's P-type. No, P gives you extra electrons. It's N-type. So that's an uppercase P. This is a lowercase p. This is P-type. This is P-type. So now I've got P-type, N-type. And so what do I have here? I've got a P, N junction. And this is the beginning of solid state devices, rectification of AC current, diodes, you name it. And it all starts with this. It all starts with this, the chemistry. This is the birth of the transistor. Transistor. And all the modern electronics that we have is based on this. Later on, we'll show you how you get the boron in and how you get the phosphorus in. You don't just come in and sprinkle it on top and hope that it goes to the lattice sites. There's a lot of processing involved. Okay, so this is where I want to hold for the, uh, the unit on semiconductors and, and uh, how it fit into the grand scheme of things. So, you know, in the books you'll see here's a, this is a, this is a very crude drawing because this is showing n-type semiconductor with, with grossly exaggerated numbers of uh, donor electrons up here. There's no mention of the donor level. So this is sort of um, semiconductivity, uh, sort of pre-3091. This is, this is uh, uh, semicondu extrinsic semiconduction for idiots, I guess you'd call it. And then the same thing here. You see all of the holes in the, in the valence band. We know better because we know there's an acceptor level and there's a donor level. Okay.